I will do my best to follow the script then. So do you see the slides? Are they up for you? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So um we will just start rocking and rolling. Um, okay, so the first thing I'm supposed to do is welcome you. So hello, welcome. Thank you for coming to my class. <laughs> and also why this class, I'm teaching this class or this class is important to me is because I've actually been in real estate since 2009 and I started my real estate career in California and then was in real estate in Texas and now in Oregon. So I am passionate and, and understand the importance of knowing your market and connecting with your local market as it pertains to being able to help clients in the specific market that you're in. So I love this content. And this is actually the fur or the third of the real estate expert of choice series. So I think yesterday was embrace, embrace your job and it started with spark your career. And then there will be another one after this that talks about defining your value. But today we're going to talk about connecting with your market um, and we'll go over different factors to research and consider to be prepared before meeting with clients or handling objections as you, um, maybe your friends and family are talking about real estate with you. This conversation will help with just navigating how to be the real estate um, expert by focusing on market data. So the different pieces that we will go over is actually knowing the market or knowing your market, which means like your local neighborhood, building your expertise, um, which will go into like what different factors about the economy are important to know that that change the market or fluctuate the local market, what tools you can be using. Um, and then we'll recap all of that at the end and, and talk about some good habits for uh, sharing statistics and data about the market. So here's the truth. This is from Gary Keller. He says that um, if it has been done in another market, it can be done in your market. Once it has been done, no matter where, it's just a matter of finding out how that can be possible in your world. I always think about this quote, and I also think about... Um, the running a mile. And when I was in school and had to run a mile every Monday in PE, they talked about how um, like a six minute mile had never been accomplished. And, and then one person did it. And then all of a sudden, everybody knew you could run a six minute mile. And so then more people started to run six minute miles and then five minute miles. And so it, if it, if that is a indicator or something that is is showing up in your world. It can't be done in my market. If it's been done somewhere else, we can make it happen in your market. It just may be figuring out the possibilities to make it a reality. So the first step is achieving, the first step to achieving the impossible in your market begins with connecting and understanding it. So we're going to start with knowing or connecting with your market. So um, what, Laura, and this is a question for you, what does connecting with your market mean to you? Um, it would mean knowing the area, knowing, being able to give my clients information on where things are in that community. Um, knowing the prices the like the price ranges in the area I just you know um valuable information as to um either a buyer wanting to move into that area how much are houses going for in that area or a seller I'm in this area how much could I sell my house for and then think of again knowing that community and how that enhances the value yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly right. Knowing um, not only the kind of lay of the land, like you said, but also like statistically, what does this neighborhood, what's the data on this neighborhood and what does appreciation do you, like, I hope it doesn't depreciate, um, but what does price increases, price decrease, like what are all the information about the area, but then also about that home and statistically what um, information is pertinent to clients. 
what um, what the Ignite book says is a well connect a well connected that is well informed agent knows everything they can possibly know about their real estate market, whether it be a neighborhood, small town, a city, county, or a segment of the market, such as downtown condos. What you choose to know well is up to you. So. Know your market. Knowing and connecting with your market is all about research and preparation. So there are two levels to market factors. There's a macro level market, and then there's a micro level market. So what would you say is a macro level market? What do you think a macro level market is? Um, macro. Uh, large like a larger market, macros. Yeah, macros. Yeah, 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 yeah. So a macro would be like large scale. So it may be yeah. the entire city or an entire metro area would be uh, on a macro scale, oh. what the market is saying. And then on the other hand, a micro level market would be something even more specific, like maybe a specific neighborhood in a city or a specific development in the town. So it's macro is large scale, micro is, is smaller, more specific scale. Um, so what do you know about your micro or macro market? Like what would be a statistic or, or a fact about your, your market? from a macro perspective and a micro perspective? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Honestly, I think that's um, where my biggest weakness is right now in personally that I'm not sure um, what area like I'm wanting to serve just because there's been so many changes in my life lately and just like being like, out of Portland, which is, um, where my, my home is, but I'm currently in another situation. I'm out in Welch's. And so I feel very confused as to what I'm doing. Like, I don't know if that explains it. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're doing great. And, and I think that that's a really good point to, uh, knowing your macro market, like your macro market is all of Portland Metro. Yes. So a statistic may be something like, uh, um, days, um, it takes how many days are like a house from yeah. being on the market. Yeah. Um, I think it was, I think I read 34 or 39. I don't remember. Yeah. And, and that's a great point. The days on the market for all of Portland Metro um, I believe in March was 57 days. 57. However, like up in Welch's, the days on market may be more or less. So when you're talking with clients and they may be hearing macro data, it's important that you can say, oh yeah, I know that stat. That's a Portland Metro statistic. However, here in Welch's or whatever neighborhood you're talking about, mm -hmm. it's actually much shorter because we have a niche market. So that would be a great example of a macro versus a micro market in a conversation to have um, regarding both. Um, it says, to be the real estate expert, you must understand your market of the moment. You see markets change constantly and sometimes rapidly, and it requires you to pay attention, read the signs, and truly understand your market. This is the only way for you to be an expert and to be the fiduciary. This is the only way that you can deliver expertise and perspective on the market that you and your clients are in. So when it comes to knowing your market, there's actually three different types of markets. A buyer's market, which the slide will tell you is, be, is more than seven months of inventory. So when the, the MLS, gives you a statistic that says we have seven and a half months of inventory, eight months of inventory. Oh, we're in a buyer's market. A seller's market is when there's less than five months of inventory. So right now in, in Portland Metro, we have 1.6 months of inventory. That would be a seller's market. And then a balanced market 
is anywhere. I mean, the sweet spot is six months of inventory, but anywhere from five to seven months of inventory is a, is a pretty healthy, balanced market. So um, the question that I had written down was what determines the type of market? I just answered the question. It's inventory. So what does a buyer's what does a buyer's market mean? Um, yes, it's more than seven months of inventory, but but truthfully, like when you're talking to buyer clients or seller clients in a buyer's market, houses are not selling extremely rapidly. A buyer's market means there are more homes for sale on the market than there are interested buyers. Supply of houses is greater than demand. There is a large inventory of houses available. This puts the buyer at an advantage and can possibly get a great home for an affordable price. So when there's a lot of homes on the market and there's few buyers, then the buyers have all the choices and can negotiate better because they're, the sellers are trying to fight for, for a limited amount of buyers. The buyer has the upper hand. So then on the opposite side, what is a seller's market? In a seller's market, demand for homes is greater than the supply of homes available, or there are more interested buyers than there are homes for sale. This puts the seller at an advantage and often creates multiple offers. This one may sound a little bit more comfortable or familiar because this is the market that we've been in for, for quite some time. There's more buyers than there are homes available. So when homes become available, it's competing with multiple buyers and multiple offers for that potential home. And then a balanced market, you have a healthy share of buyers and sellers and a good amount of inventory. A balanced market is generally represented by having six months of inventory available. It means there are plenty of both houses and buyers at the same time. I will tell you, I have very rarely seen a balanced market, meaning that the the swing from buyer's market to seller's market happens quickly. It doesn't stay in a, a balanced market very long. And we'll talk more about that. And the reason is because of other economic factors that change the market and change the players in the market, whether it's taking buyers out of the market or taking sellers out of the market, um, the swing happens. So markets don't stay balanced very long. And, and when that happens, it's called a shift. A shift occurs when the market moves from one to the other, a buyer's to a seller's. Um, so what factors do you guys think cause a market shift? If you had to guess what- Interest rates. Um... That's a huge one. Uh, the other one we're experiencing right now is inflation, mm -hmm. which has caused interest rates to go up. I mean, and, and that's a macro scale, right? We talked about like things that'll affect a, a large community of people buying or selling, like a macro scale economic shift factor would be interest rates or inflation, um, a micro level factor maybe um that the there's a new tech company that decides to build a campus in a specific city and that could affect the micro economy but it's not going to affect the state or the country that specific community may shift their market based on that information um so the next question on here is how can knowing your market help you prepare for a shift? What would you say? Um, you're able to, if you know information, even historical information, you're able to make, um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Oh my gosh. Um, it's pregnancy brain. It's fine. <laughs> oh my gosh. I went to, I had a doctor's appointment. I went to the wrong clinic. I went like really like, it's Mount hood. I, the name was Mount hood. So I stopped. I just drove to the hospital and I'm like, I'm here for my appointment. I didn't know it was terrible. Anyways. Um, <laughs> 
Um, what, how can you, uh, I lost it. I'm sorry. Okay. The question is how can knowing your market help you prepare for any shifts? Any thoughts? Knowing how to explain to um, either buyer or seller um, how to properly, oh my gosh, is it snowing? It's snowing. Um, Did my screen stop sharing? No. You can still see it? Yeah. No, 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 I can see you. Oh, here, let me. Meant to... There we go. Okay. Can you see my screen again? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, Not to make you lose your train of thought again. <laughs> um, it can help you prepare to be able to um, maybe understand better pricing um, in homes, um, how you're able to negotiate for your buyer. Um, yeah. Yep. And understanding those market factors could tell you like in that negotiation process, like what, what could be happening, what future, uh, things to look out for in a transaction or, or as a homeowner, why you may want to buy now versus waiting six months. So just knowing those factors and knowing how to prepare for a shift, shift can help you be a better fiduciary for your clients. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about inventory. Oops, what side are we on? So um, now that we know the types of markets, buyer, seller, balanced, and it's based on inventory. Let's talk a little bit about inventory. Um, as we mentioned, inventory is the primary factor in determining what kind of market we are in. So what tool, and you guys may have the answer for this, may not, um, what tool do you think you use to determine inventory? Like where would you get that statistic? The RMLS? Yep. Yep. Exactly right, Lauda. The MLS will tell you, and if you're a member of our MLS, then um, they put out actually every month something called a market action report. They email it to you. You can also download it from the RMLS website. And it gives you all of that data. It shares um, inventory, but it also shares days on market, average price, type of market, um, changes in the market, inventory based on class. So there's a ton of information you can get from that market action report. Um, however, yes, the tool for determining inventory is the MLS. So does anybody know, do either of you know the answers to these questions on the screen? What, first one being, what is the inventory in your market? You guys know? Lynn, what market are you I, in? I just downloaded it. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Lynn, what off what um what city are you out of? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I'm out of the uh Portland office. You're out of my office. How have we not met Hi. yet? Hi. <laughs> well, uh, I'm actually going to be working out of Roseburg though. Oh, okay. So you That's actually why. then cover a wide range of, <laughs> of right. <laughs> and your days on market is going to look different depending on who you're representing in what territory. So do you happen right. to know your um, days on market or your inventory? I don't know. I don't know anything yet. I've been here like two weeks. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Well then I hope so. that this is helpful in, in figuring out how to find that information. Uh, Lada, you said you just downloaded the report. Yeah, it, um, it was 1.6 months. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, that's perfect. What about, what is the average number of days a home stays on the market? And you said the answer earlier, it was 57. <laughs> <laughs> you were listening. Love it. What about, what is the average price a home in your market sells for? Average price. I think it was like five. So there was a 586,000 and then there was like a 525,000, I think. I don't remember which number was which, but there was like medium. Yep. 
Yep. So there's an average and then there's the median home price. Okay. And so the, the average, average was like more, it was higher, right? Like 580 something. 584, five. Okay. Yep. okay. So um, great job finding that information so quickly. Those are kind of the typical things that you'll get asked is what's inventory like, especially in a seller's market, because we want an increase in inventory. Um, what is days on market, especially in a shifting market, because um, days on market will determine if the market is shifting, if things are sitting longer than they were, then maybe we're moving from a seller's market to a a buyer's market if more and if more things are coming on the market and then average price I mean we always want an appreciation however in a seller's market appreciation happens much quicker which we've seen in the last couple of years so um great job and we talked about this a little bit but based on your inventory what type of real estate market are we in currently definitely I feel like a seller's market um, I've been to a couple open houses and there've been multiple offers. The house that I'm under contract with, they had multiple, multiple offers. So yeah, you're experiencing that seller's market for sure. Okay. So then the next thing, um, in the know your market is knowing interest rates and having a great lender partner. So interest rates and lender regulations play an important role in the status of your market. As interest rates rise, buying power starts to dip because affordability decreases. And this is something that we're also experiencing right now with the fluctuation in interest rates. And it's our job to know the effects of changes in interest rates. So like... If interest rates go up, what does that mean? It takes buyers out of the market. They no longer can afford the same uh, house that they could have before interest rates increased. They may not be able to afford a house at all based on interest rate increases. Um, however, I truly believe that it's important to have a lender partner or multiple lender partners because they all have different programs that can be your leverage in having the conversation about lending regulations and most up-to-date information about lending. Um, we actually get weekly updates from our partners at Place Mortgage. So um, you should, you guys should both start to get that information from Jesse at Place Mortgage that will give you like a script to use today or this week based on interest rates. What are interest rates? What you should know as the agent regarding current policies. So having that information and having a partner that can share that with you just makes your job easier in knowing the market. Um, the other thing to know is that paying attention to lender regulations can help you get a feel for where the market is headed. If lenders are changing their policies, they could be signaling that a market shift is on the way or already here. So not that you have to know every policy, not that you have to know every regulation, but just keeping a pulse on our policies and regulations changing could be an indicator of a shift in the market because they're having to, to shift with changes in interest rates, changes in inflation, changes to regulatory policies. So just know that that's something that could affect the market. Um, it says lenders may be reacting to other economic fa factors that we as agents aren't in tune with. So it's important to keep a close eye on these regulations for any changes. And again, I would partner with someone who can help you do that. Um, Yeah, I feel any questions on, on lender regulations or interest rates? So basically um, going to multiple, like how would one know, I guess, how a lender or how well you can work with a lender until you kind of try that lender out, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I would interview lenders and um, potentially send your clients to a few to, to see how you work best together um, because they're an, an important part 
of the buying process. So being able to find someone that you trust and you feel confident recommending to your clients who are going to help them with such an important part of their purchasing decisions and their abilities to purchase um, is important. And someone who you truly feel is a partner to you is important. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Okay. Knowing your market factor number three is a economic factors. So we talked about inventory, which is something that we are very familiar with as agents, interest rates, having a great lender partner. The other thing is just other economic factors. So um, this is the best way to stay ahead of potential market shifts. Inventory is kind of a lagging measure. It's telling us after the fact that things have changed. However, looking at economic factors could be an indicator of future changes or upcoming changes. So one of them being unemployment. So that would be a macro level, like um, economic factor that could affect housing. So what, let's say for instance, unemployment is rising. What would that mean for housing? Or future housing? That less people are buying or able to buy. Um, they'll there's people who like might pull their houses from list like selling a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think you're right, Lauda. That could also go both ways. Like if someone loses their job, they could potentially no longer be able to afford their house. So it might create a seller. However, it's going to change their ability to buy houses. So it may um, take buyers out of the market and create renters. Um or someone who was a renter no longer not, not be able to explore the opportunity of buying at this moment. So it could it could affect selling and buying. What about um, people entering or exiting the workforce? Like what would workers entering the workforce do to the market? Um, I would imagine boost it there would be more demand yeah, um, for sure absolutely it would create um, more people who can buy houses mm -hmm. and so it might increase um the amount of buyers and create more of a seller's market this is something that um i mean I think about it, like if you're thinking about it from a macro scale, if you have an influx of people coming into the workforce, that would be kind of a generational change. Like when all of the baby boomers came of age to be able to sell houses, that would be a large influx of people that were able to buy and create a buyer's market. Um, on a micro level, that may look like a tech company coming into town and creating an influx of jobs and, and people that are going to buy in your city or a sports team coming or a new school being built like those new things coming to your market that are going to attract potential employees is something that on a micro level is an economic factor that would affect um, buyers and sellers. Um, I love this disclaimer. It says, your job is not to become a research scientist. It is to understand how certain economic indicators could impact the housing market going forward. I always think about economic factors as like a pendulum. Like if, if one side of the pendulum is a buyer's market and one side of the pendulum is a seller's market, is there something that's like poking the pendulum on this side that says, oh, unemployment's going up. We're gonna we're gonna change. We're gonna shift the market. Or oh, more workers coming in to our our area based on a new school being built. Are we gonna like tick the pendulum to the other side? So not your job to be a research scientist. Just to understand well enough to say what's going on in the economy, and could this affect my market? 
from buyers to sellers. I caution against positive versus negative because there's always a market for somebody, whether it's a buyer or a seller or an investor, there's always a market for somebody. Okay. And then the last factor in knowing your market is just knowing other market factors. What a, what a profound term, other important market factors. <laughs> um, and this is getting again into the micro level of knowing your market. So this is getting uh, neighborhood specific. It says, as you be begin previewing homes in certain neighborhoods and having open houses, it's good practice to become familiar with certain statistics of the different neighborhoods in your market. So what other fac market factors can you think of that might be good to investigate? Developments in, in the works like roads, housing developments. The closing of the hospital. The <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just saying from personal um, being out here, they just closed the Mount Hood uh, Legacy Women's Birthing Center. Oh. So now I have to drive or be in Portland to be able to have my baby. Um, wow. So yeah. That's a huge one. And it's driving jobs out of the city too, yeah. because now there's no longer employment for people at that birthing center and they've got to drive into Portland. So yeah, it and it's, it's all of like Gresham, Troutdale, like all that area. It may cause people, those people who are working there to move out mm -hmm. of the area too. So that's a huge market factor is closing of hospitals, closing of birthing centers, new schools being built new shopping centers coming in. Anytime there's new, it's a market factor when it comes to a neighborhood. A new restaurant comes in. A new restaurant closes down. A gas station gets bit, uh, put in on the corner. Any of those things will affect your local market. Okay, any ahas on these sections? Inventory, interest rates, economic factors, neighborhood factors, anything you learned based on that content? Yes, um, just that it's important. It is super important to be able to have that information, even though it's definitely at, you know, you can Google it really quick or you can look at look it up. It's important to keep up to date so that you're able to have these conversations fluidly rather than, um, oh, hold on, let me find out. Like, I felt really stuck right there. I was like, wait, this is things I should know <laughs> because, you, you know, I'm like going through, um, like I'm new. So like, these are things that I should be looking at. And sometimes I think that it's intimidating because it feels like a whole other language. Yeah, I, you're totally right. Like days on market, nothing I thought about before real estate. Inventory, forget it. Like that was not on my radar before getting into real estate. And you'll learn as you have more conversations with buyers and sellers that those things become second nature and things that you're you're looking at anyways as you're looking for properties for them or you're having a conversation about selling their house. Like those pieces will become very second nature because you're just in them day in and day out. So it feels a little strange right now, but I promise you that everything we talked about so far is going to feel very easy really soon. Okay, let's move on to the second part because we've just talked about all of our data, like all of the information that we research and we have access to that it's our job to share with the clients. Now let's talk about building your expertise. What it says is, so you now know that to connect with your market, you must know and keep up with the market. Yet you may be thinking, how do you learn about your market? So there's much to know. Let's talk about building your expertise. Okay. Knowing the numbers is the first step. So we just talked about having raw data. Understanding, interpreting, and applying the numbers to your market, to your lead generation, and your lead follow-up conversations are equally important. So now that we have the raw data, how do we talk about it? How do we interpret it? How do we have educated conversations around those numbers? 
Again, there's four pieces to building your expertise. Learn the market, learn your client, listen to individuals and keep the headlines in context. That's a fun one. So let's start with learn the market. So on top of having the raw data here, like the, I mean, the market action report will do this for you, but it'll give you statistics that will help you interpret and have a conversation around, okay, we have 1.6 months of inventory. Well, is that good? Is that bad? Should I be nervous? Should I be excited? Like, how do you interpret that data? So we call that the language of real estate, also known as a lore report, language of real estate, um, and how your market is moving. So is 1.6 months an increase, a decrease? So how do you tell that story? It's important to be very focused on potential changes that seem to be more than seasonality or normal flow. So this is as you're looking at those increases or decreases and the percent change, it's important to know that generally speaking, transactions and prices tend to be higher in the summer while market inventory typically slows down in the winter. Market fluctuations outside of this scope can indicate changes are coming. Why do you think that, that we have that seasonality? Why do you think that the market is higher in the summer? Any thoughts? Um, I think the sunshine makes people happy. <laughs> no. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's wanting to show how, like, it's definitely um, better to go see a house in the broad daylight, to check out, you know, how the sun does come in because we live in this place where it's raining a lot and um, open houses, things like that. People don't want to think about moving when it's raining or snowing or I don't know. I mean, I, those are all my assumptions. I feel like that. I feel like if they have children, you know, school would be a factor. You'd want to move in the summer while they're out of school. Yeah, I think you're both right. I I definitely am depressed when the, it's raining all the time. I don't want to move and be out in the rain. So, that I think you're absolutely right. That and Lynn, you're a hundred percent correct too. It's easier with, for families with kids to move when the kids aren't in school, not having to change their school halfway through the year. Um, it's it's a natural time for people to want to move during those summer months. And that's important to know if you're going into a conversation um, with someone who has kids. Like what are all the reasons that the summer months are important to them? The other piece of that, like why the winter months are, are kind of a lower season is definitely weather. People don't want to move in the snow and holidays. A lot of people don't want to move during the holidays. Um, and on the complete opposite side of that, I'll tell you all the general reasons why people may or may not want to. And then there's going to be people that have to, they have to be out of their house by the end of the year. They have to move across the country for a job. They have to sell in 2023 for tax reasons. They have to buy before the end of the year. They want to be in a new house before the holidays. So there's generally speaking, and then there's understanding and knowing your clients. So do they have kids? Are like, do they have a job transfer? Do they have, um, did, did they inherit a bunch of money that they have to spend? Did, is there a death in the family? Like all of those reasons and why it's important to like know the market and then know your client is important. Um, as you, and then it start, goes on to say, as you track the bigger market, track your own business as well. When you use tracking tools to track your leads, your appointments, your transactions, you're able to notice your trends as well. Maybe you have the seasonality of the market and, and the beginning of the year is slow and then spring and summer is really busy. And then the end of the year is slow again. And maybe you might be the opposite. Maybe the beginning of the year, all of your clients are, are buying and selling because you represent a niche market where people want to be in homes because it's they're buying a, a second home in the snow and they want to be able to rent it out to Airbnb. So just knowing your market and your stats is important as well. 
any thoughts or questions on learn the market? Okay, second, learn your clientele. I kind of alluded to this one already. As you are monitoring, monitoring the numbers in your market, ask yourself who might benefit from current and future trends and who might be at risk. Notice any trends in what people are saying to you. New objections might come into the picture while others aren't as importantly sudden or as it aren't as important suddenly and recognizing patterns is key to building your expertise. So kind of like we've talked about with some of the different stats. Okay, unemployment has increased. Who needs to know that? Or who may I need to have a conversation with regarding that? You probably need to have a conversation with your sellers because if they've lost their job, then, then there may be more motivation to sell the house. Or if your buyers lost their job, that may take them out of the buying process altogether. So as you think through the information that you're absorbing, who needs to know that information? And what trends could be affecting clients right now? Interest rates is another one that affects buyers. So who needs to know that interest rates are, are increasing and who might be at risk? Uh, the ebbs, flows, and shifts of the market can be great for different types of clients. A shift might be great for investors or those with cash looking for looking to move into a neighborhood. So interest rates is, a, is the perfect example of this, where it may take your buyers who are wanting a loan out of the buying process. So when interest rates go up, you may need to have a conversation with your buyers but it could be a really great time for investors who, who are not needing a loan and who are paying cash. So what type of buyer you're having a conversation with um, may change the conversation. I feel like that was like three levels deep on learning your clientele. And then it, could, um, it wraps up by saying, know who could benefit from the changes you're noticing in your market numbers. Keep this in mind when it comes to the lead generation and lead follow-up that will uh, that we will cover in the next section of this course, which is listen to individuals. And I think this is a, a, a really important one because if we're not giving our clients the information that they're using to, to make decisions, they're getting that information from somewhere. So it says, Go to where your people are, talk with the people who are learning about the market, your clients and potential clients, and chat with them. And more importantly, listen to them. The knowledge they provide could be very helpful for you as you make sense of the market and, as importantly, what your clients think of the market. As you make sense of the market, it's just as important that you listen to uh, listen and understand what your clients think of the market. For example, people may be saying interest rates keep going up, so I better buy now. Or my neighbor's house hasn't sold, so I'm going to hold off selling mine because the market must not be good now. They're creating a story about the market based on their information and their thinking. So it's important to understand where they're getting that information. Like, Okay, what in that example, they're talking to their neighbor or they may be reading something on the news. The story they hear might be macro level. For example, oh, interest rates are going up or, or um, inventory is down on a macro level, but on the micro level, their neighborhood might be just fine. On the other side of that, person's talking to their neighbor and saying their house isn't sold. Well, that's as micro as you can get. There may be something wrong with that house that the neighbor doesn't know. So them saying, oh, I need to hold off because my neighbor's house isn't selling could be a moot point for their house specifically. So and then, listen to where that information is coming from. Where that comes in where like, you know, the market, you know, certain numbers and be able to say, well, you know what, actually, I know that in this area, you know, your particular house 
prices in this range, like just being able to have that like demographic and yep. information. Yep. Exactly, Lauda. That's exactly why it's important to know your data. Oh, their house isn't selling, but every other house in this neighborhood has sold in 30 days or less. And the average days on market is 57. So you actually have a hot market here. There's something might be up with that one house. Um, does anybody, do either of you uh, attend script practice with Matt Spate in the morning? I do. So he's really good at this. Um, when people ask, how's the market? You always respond with more questions. Like yeah. that's good listening. Instead of giving them an answer, about the <laughs> understanding, well, uh, tell me, are you looking to buy or sell? Oh, what's important to what's important to you about that market? Where do you live? Like getting just a couple layers deep on on what where they're at in their in their process of buying or selling, what they're thinking can give you a better indicator of how to have that conversation because it depends on their market. Okay, and then the best one of all, keep the headlines in context. As you learn your market and your clientele, clientele be aware that headlines can be persuasive. So where do you suspect that most buyers and sellers get their information? If you weren't in real estate, where would you get your information? Redfin, Google, um, or whatever website I'm looking at to look at listings. Yeah. Even broader than that, like where do you hear conversations about real estate or about interest rates or economic factors? TV. Yeah. The news. Yeah. The news. Social media. Friends. They have the example of the local paper in here. I don't know if local papers are still a thing. Um, it is. <laughs> so just understand that the reason that news exists is, or headlines exist is to grasp someone's attention. So it's always going to be a shock factor of a headline. So keeping the headlines in context is super important. Once you figure out where your clients get their information, read what they read and see if you can help them expand their understanding. I don't know how many times like scrolling through social media or scrolling through headlines online. And I just read the headline and then I move on. I feel like I've got enough information. However, is that doing a disservice to, to our industry or to our market? So understanding those headlines and keeping them in context for clients is important. Um, it says tip on here, always pay attention to your local MLS to stay on top of what's happening in your market. Your clients rely on you to put the market in context for them. And the MLS doesn't lie. It's the raw data. Okay. Build your market, learn the market, learn the clientele, listen to individuals and keep the headlines in context. What are your ahas about that? Any thoughts? Um, it's important in how you receive information or how you get information from people, even um, from the get-go. Um, you know, I tell people I'm a real estate agent kind of right off the bat. First of all, I'm really proud of myself. <laughs> Second of all, it's just like, I have to put myself out there. Otherwise I'm just louder, you know? Um, so then being able to, um, like you say, understand the clientele, uh, build connections um, in all ways so that you can better understand the wants and needs of people. Totally. This is your unique value proposition as opposed to every other realtor or every other human being. Your unique value is you understand and can help someone navigate the market. So love that. Thank you for sharing. Okay. We know our market. We've built our expertise. Now, what are the resources we can use to help this be a little bit easier as we are building these skills? So there's two um, apps that KW has put together 
that are super helpful. There's KW Command, and then there's the KW app. Do you have either of these downloaded? Yeah. Have you, uh, which one or both, or do you have both? I have both. Have you used them yet? Um, I have used the command. Awesome. Um, quite a bit. And then the KW app, Not, I think I've gone on it a couple of times, but. So like um, these are just two and we'll go into what they, how to use them and, and what they're, they're best for. Are there any other apps that have been helpful for you in getting started in navigating the market or navigating real estate? TRMLS. Yeah, that's a huge one. Uh, the last time I taught this class, someone said there's an app called Mortgage Daily, and um, that gives them just like a snippet of what's going on in the lending world, um, which I thought is a really good app. Oh, I think I um, just off of Facebook, I want to see what it what it was. It was uh, Keeping Current Matters. Yeah. Keeping Current Matters is a really good one. I love that. So um, let's dive into what these two apps look like. So the command app is the digital version or KDB fan is the digital version of the desktop version of command, which is your contact management system. It's your, uh, your marketing and design system. It's your transaction management system. So this is a tool for you. Command is your tool to manage every aspect of your business on the back end. So the more you input things into command, the more the app becomes beneficial because it'll send you reminders. You can send emails through it and text messages and phone calls. Um, you can get updates on transactions and move your business along through KW command. The KW app, so command is for you. The KW app is for your clients. So this is one, and I was actually using this over the weekend, it allows your clients to look at everything that's for sale, for sale or everything that's on the MLS currently and do their own, like set up their own searches for different neighborhoods, different price points, build out searches based on bedrooms, bathrooms, amenities. Um, so it's a great tool for them to use that also keeps them in your network. Like, or keeps them in, like under your, um, like under your wing, I guess, because this app is also connected to you. So when they input their search criteria, they save searches, it goes into your database. When they save properties, it saves it in their contact in your command. So you can see what they're doing and what they're liking. It also has a button on there that says like call agent or email agent, and it's got your phone number and your email. So it keeps them connected to you at all times and looks like you have all the tools that they need in order to uh, navigate this process. So command is for you, the KDB app is for your client. I mean, and you, I use it all the time to look at properties in, in my neighborhood, or if I'm out driving around, I'm like, oh, there's a for sale sign. Let's see how much that house is going for. Then um, I pull up my command app. Another great tool um, and, and something that's very I, gosh, when I started in the business, social media wasn't such a big thing, um, but is now a big part of building your business, telling your story and getting market data out or connecting with clients and being a local expert is social media. So there's a daily success system that's called the 1051. And it's a social media engagement plan. So though there's going to be a whole session in Ignite on social media. So know that they'll dive deep into social media on a later day in Ignite. Um, but this is a, a fun one that kind of gets you started with building out your, your social media plan. 
So it says social media is a great way to market yourself freely, and you should be active on many, if not all of the popular social media networks. A tip for doing this, when you post on social media, you should follow a 80-20 posting plan. 80% of your posts should not be about real estate. It should be about other interests you have. And the reason being is people are going to connect with you because they feel like they know you, they like you because you're similar, and they can trust you because you have something in common. So as you're building out your social media plan for your business, 80% of the things you post should be about you. And 20 should be about being the local expert in real estate. Um, so if you put that into numbers, only one out of every five original posts you create should be about real estate. One in five. In your participation guide uh, for this session, there's, let's see, I had it. I think it's page 3.8. Yes, it talks about brainstorming your social media personality. I think this is so fun. Um, so this is a little activity and I love this. It says, look for the activity. Oh no. Yeah, look for the activity labeled brainstorming your social media personality on page 3.8. Open your social media. So most classes say, okay, get off your phone, get off social media. I'm telling you to get on your phone, get on social media and look at some of your recent posts your recent likes, and your recent shares. And make a list of your interests that do not include real estate. They could be cute puppy pictures, nice dining experiences, unique tattoos, things that are in nature. These interests are key to establishing your brand and presence on the internet what you want to be associated with. For me, it would be a lot of things about toddlers, dogs. That's probably about it. Toddlers and dogs is my life right now. Work. If you're looking at your social media, how would you describe your social media personality? <laughs> yeah. Cat? Brat? When I do get on Facebook, I'm I don't it's it's gotten so weird. My timeline has gotten so weird because of the, this real estate stuff that I look at and definitely talk about. So my phone has a lot more advertisements. So it's like kind of touching bases with some people that I haven't spoken to. Um like showing, you know family events it's like oh congratulations and just kind of to me I'm like I'm making connect to my husband it's like you're just scrolling I'm like no because their daughter just turned this old and she's gonna need a new room soon <laughs> so uh, you know it's that yeah. um but I'm pretty out there I don't post a lot I guess that's okay. If you're Dating. liking specific things, like, so Jordan, who's the assistant team leader here at our office, she always posts or likes dog videos. And so that would be something that she connects with people on is dog videos. I connect with people who have young children because I have a young kid. Um, so just finding those similarities will help you connect with your market and attract other people who are attracted to the same things that you are. Um, so just something to think about as you're building out your social media personality is for every five personal posts, one should be about real estate, no more than that. Um, and what your so, uh, social media plan should be is liking 10 posts a day, writing five comments a day, and sending one direct message a day. 10, 5, 1. This will start to increase your engagement. Okay. 
other things that can help you in knowing your market and enriching your daily success system, um, studying your market center reports. We as an office put out every month our language of real estate, which is how many listings were taken, how many contracts were written, how many closings happened. So you can always get that information based on your office as well as your MLS. You should also be previewing homes because it'll give you a great indicator of if there's a certain market or a certain neighborhood that's got a lot of homes for sale, why that might be. Um, also understanding different builders. As you start to go through different homes, you can recognize builder qualities um, that will help in helping navigate your buyers, finding the right home for them. Taking MLS courses because it'll help you understand the RMLS better and help you to find statistics and, and uh, generate your own reports. Visit and hold open houses study the language of real estate, read the millionaire real estate agent. These are all really good success habits. Can you think of any other habits or, or enrichments that might be important? Um, just... Read, but I feel one of my goals is to um, either read more business books or mm -hmm. listen to business podcasts. Um, I love that. Yeah, that'll give you a good sense of business practices and how to navigate owning your own business now. I love that. I also think driving around, as silly as that sounds, but just understanding the lay of the land is important because then you can help clients that may be looking for a specific neighborhood and say, oh, well, this one would be great because it's right by this school or this hospital or this business that I know is, is important to you or, oh, it's got great walking trails and I know you have dogs. So driving around and just getting the lay of the land is another one that can help with building your expertise. Okay, so recap. We've learned about knowing your market, types of markets, how inventory affects the market, how interest rates affect the market, economic factors, market factors. And then once you have the data, how to interpret it, like what does it mean for the market? What does it mean for the client? What does it mean for the individual? And how headlines can affect um, the thinking process for your clients. Based on that, this aha section has very specific questions. So I don't know if it's in your book where it prompts you to write these down. But I know if I don't write things down, I don't implement them. So the prompt questions for you are, how has your thinking changed based on this uh, section? And what ideas or mindset were new? Or would you like to implement? What do you feel differently about? And what was meaningful to you? How will your behaviors be different going forward? What actions will you take? What tools, models, or systems will you use? How will they make you accountable? I encourage you guys both to, to think about these different things and maybe write down your answers um, so that and I hope that every session has this uh, because it'll help you to really ground what was important about this session and how you can implement it into your business. Okay, the next section, success systems. I don't know, have you guys been going into this at all? Like making calls on the, like on the Zoom? No, Lynn, you're telling me no. Okay, well, in that case, we blew through that. What do you guys think? Any last words, thoughts, questions? No. I really enjoyed how like I can give you one 
way of saying things and then you just make it your like you enhance it and shorten it but make it so much it, like it make more sense oh <laughs> my goodness explain it well but, thank you for that feedback I appreciate that sometimes I don't know if I'm making sense so uh, that's that's nice to hear <laughs> no definitely I enjoyed the class I um I do think that knowing knowing these things are important but the way that you explained it makes sense as to why it's important yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well just like the data like what the numbers are there and like why are they important like we get to decide that so thank you for the feedback um i will let you guys have the rest of your hour back um i hope you have a, a fantastic tuesday and if you need me for anything call me text me email me i am here for you through ignite um, but also in general. So if you need me, I am here. Otherwise, happy Tuesday, you guys. Happy Thanks, night. <laughs> All right. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.